Okay, so this week I'm going to be talking about sensory issues. Now, I'll start by talking about what some of them are, and then I'll move on to looking at some strategies to help combat some of these, these areas of need. So, there are a range of sensory needs that will be in pretty much all of our classrooms. And sometimes, and quite often, they're actually linked to other special educational needs. So, for example, autism is often associated with sensory needs, so is ADHD, um, but even things like dyslexia, dyscalculia, dyspraxia, they may not be directly linked to sensory needs, but quite often they do coexist. So it's about being aware of all sorts of reasons for sensory needs, but sensory needs are really important to address. And quite often, challenging behaviours can actually be as a result of some form of sensory need that isn't being addressed. So we, we really need to be understanding of these needs and accommodating of them. So, for example, a very simple one is a sense of smell. Okay, now I've got quite sensitive nose, so I can smell, for example, I walk into the house, oh, somebody's cutting cucumber in the kitchen. I can smell it as I walk into the house, and I love that smell, so that's great. There are other smells that literally make me want to gag, and other people won't even notice there's a smell. So it can be quite a powerful thing, a sense of smell. Um, mine became incredibly heightened when um, each time I was pregnant, and there was a, a washing detergent, which and um, there was fabric softener of some sort. And when I put on clothes that had last been washed before I'd got pregnant, I'd literally feel like gagging, it was that bad. So, so we need to be aware of these things. It could be the perfume a teacher's wearing, it could be an item of clothing, it could be a, a piece of equipment that is being used. Um, so sometimes, you know, things like um, rubbers, for example, erasers, you know, they, they can have a smell. And for some children, that can be so overpowering that it's taking away um, their ability to focus on their work and they may appear to be acting out you know sort of challenging behavior and it could just be that those smells I mean I'm going to be referring to um, Kathy Hooten's books a lot today and this picture I don't know if that can be seen um, that sort of all those colors merging that's the sort of swirl of smells the sort of overloading of, of senses because of the fumes that, that can occur so that's that smell. Then, then there's texture. Um, for me, it's labels in the back. You know, if I've got a label in the back of my clothes, I will quite literally sort of pull it round and, and, and cut it out while I'm wearing that item of clothing. I've been, um, I've had people I've worked with before say, no, let me cut that out for you because they've seen holes in the back of my tops where I've, I've had to cut, you know, it just irritates. Um, the picture in here that I've shown before, and it really sums it up again, one of, Kathy Hootman's brilliant contribution. She shows, let me just find it, that picture of that, that dog just totally covered in, in clothes pegs. Now, you know, if you can imagine, if, if you were in that position, how uncomfortable that would feel. Well, if you're feeling irritated by a piece of clothing, for example, a, a sense of touch, then how are you meant to concentrate on your work? Of course you're going to act out. You know, it's about being aware of these things. So texture could be something like the clothing but it could also be texture of food at lunchtime it could be literally texture of, of paper I've talked before about Rosie um, somebody I taught who she's a brilliant I do mean brilliant artist now she has she has autism but she also she she cannot stand not always but a lot of the time she can't stand the touch of paper against her hand now if you can imagine being in a school and, and that feel of paper being one of those irritants then how hard is it to concentrate on your work you know um we had the solution of she had fingerless gloves so she could protect her hands i think it was her hockey gloves she was using she could protect her fingers from touching the page they had the gloves she could still finally use her fingers she also used a laptop which again minimize the amount of paper. We also tried her out with different textures of paper because not all paper feels the same. So it could be that a rougher sugar paper might actually feel nicer. So, you know, the, the touch of, if it's something like paper, can you imagine? So we need to be aware that sensory issues include touch and the texture could be clothing. I'll come to some more solutions about that afterwards, but it, it could be the equipment that is being used that is, is the issue sounds. Now, 
there are all sorts of sounds in school. There are different pitches, frequencies and volumes that can affect people differently. I've worked with a colleague who just can't stand the buzzing of a light. I find it mildly irritating, but for her, that's really hard for her to concentrate. And she had to teach while this was going on and sort of like try and get that out of her head. Now, for children, that, that's the same thing. It, it could be the sound of a, a light. It could be the sound of a... Um, a radiator. It could be the sound of, again, go back to pencil and paper, it could be the, 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 the sound that the pencil makes or the pen makes when you're writing. Imagine if that sound felt like a drill going off um, outside. You know how you feel when there's workmen, not, not um, saying anything against workmen, but workmen working outside and there's this constant noise of drills and hammers. Imagine if that's how your head felt in a classroom. So different sounds that may be easy for some people to dismiss might be overwhelming for someone with sensory needs. So we need to be aware of, of these different things. Um, sights, so it could be things like the lights. It could be the lighting is too bright or it's too dim. It could be, you know when the lights flicker slightly when they're about to go. Um, hopefully with LEDs this will start to, to disappear as an issue, but you know, that, that flickering light which can give anybody a headache. Well, subtleties within that can be, effect, you know, can be a, a real irritant for somebody with sensory needs. So if you've got the um, interactive whiteboard and you've got it on the wrong colour, the light, the sight of that could be absolutely awful. Again, I'm going to find a picture for you from... Um, from all, all cats, no, from inside Asperger's looking out. Um, and we've got that one, the one with the um, all those sort of swirling -y things. But also this idea that the playground is a bit like these birds, this flock of birds, just overwhelming, everything coming at you. Oh my gosh, oh gosh, I can't, can't take it. So if you think about it, you know, displays, for example, overloaded displays can just be overpowering, overwhelming for a child with sensory needs. So we need to think about some solutions and there are solutions okay but it's about finding things that are calming. So just as sensory issues can be an irritant to the extent that it is the only thing filling your head or your body, um, there are also ones that can have the opposite effect and be calming so we need to think about it. People like Born Anxious, they do clothing without labels and without seams and things that irritate somebody. Somebody who's got difficulties with the textures will find the clothing by Born Anxious much easier to wear and they do a school uniform range. There are other people, I think M&S do a seamless trousers and things like that. But having flexibility about our school uniform so that children can be wearing things that are not going to make them uncomfortable. Um, Rosie, who I've talked about before, she's very uncomfortable in a skirt. And why can't she wear trousers? You know, she can wear trousers, she's comfortable in trousers. Skirts make her so uncomfortable, but she's expected to somehow cope regardless and get on with her work. But she's uncomfortable. Why are we doing this to her? And she's just one example, okay? So, so thinking about how flexible we can be with our uniform could make a huge difference to someone's learning. You know, maybe wearing the, um, the games kit, the PE kit, could be more comfortable for some children. Just making these modifications um, and knowing where you can go to get clothes that are more comfortable. With sounds, having headphones, having some form of headphone which is playing maybe something that the child finds calming. It may be crazy music for someone else, but if that's what calms the child down, headphones. Also just noise reduction headphones so they're not hearing the outside thing. If you're doing that, obviously you do need to have a signal so the child knows to come back and pay attention. But this could make a huge difference. It might be soothing music, whatever, whatever soothes them. We can't predict what will soothe someone else. That is for them to tell us. We have to listen to our pupils and listen to our parents. They know. You know, it's all about us saying, oh, I find Mozart really calming. So why don't you listen to some Mozart? They might not find that calming. They might find madness calming, I don't know. Whatever it is, they need, the child needs to have what is calming for them. And that's really important. 
if what is um, winding them up is maybe a smell, one very simple solution is to have a, a tissue or a hanky with a smell on it that they find comforting. So when the smells around them are overwhelming, they can just put that tissue to their nose, breathing something that will calm them back down again. For some people, a specific smell can actually be calming. And we can, you know, there's all sorts of um, essential oils we can get that we could just find one that was just, just enough to be calming. Not enough to put anyone else off, but enough to be calming for them. Um, having an object that feels right. So for some, back to my good old, old faithful puppets, um, having something soft and fluffy. So like um, having one of the puppets or a cuddly toy just on their desks, just in their pocket, even a bit of fur in their pocket, sort of a material that is the right texture. It may be something coarse. Um, for some people it's something soft, for others it is actually something coarse. So something that they could have that would just, just touching it calms them down, calms them down. So that's, that's one possibility. Another is, and I meant to go and get it, it's putty. You know the therapeutic putty? You can pull at it and things. Some, for some people just playing with that therapeutic putty can be calming and there's different resistance so you can get a soft one but you can also get a really hard one and, and the way you squeeze that is going to be calming for some people. Others it's an object such as you've seen these um, probably these fidget squares so this has a thing that moves around it has a another one that moves around differently it has clicky things I advise against clicky things in a classroom that will irritate other people but very satisfying is this little ball bearing I don't know if you can see that that you can sort of roll around with your finger um, so again think about we want it to be silent though so these are great but find a silent version um, sometimes simply having something like a Lego brick to hold you've got loads of different textures in that you've got the textures on different sides that can be calming. I quite often hold a dice that's um, multi-sided. It's actually one used for Dungeons and Dragons and that sort of game. It's got, I think it's got eight sides or something, I don't know how many, but it's, it's really comforting. Um, simple Unifix cubes can be a texture that some will find calming. I've made before in, um, in, in videos my fidget strings. So that, I've got four different strands, I don't know how well that can be seen, four different strands of thread here. They're all different textures. Now, I've chosen a thick one there, a bumpy one there, a very soft one there, and one that's just a nice colour for me. Now, again, if you're doing something like this, the child chooses the threads because the child will have colours they like and textures they like. So you, you tie it at the end and then you do a four strand plait, which is simply separate your four strands. You then take the outer ones and go, under two, over one. You weave it under two, over one. The outer one each time, under two, over one. Under two, over one. Now I'm going to continue making this while I'm talking and you'll see just how quickly you can make something like this. It's always taking the outer threads, under two threads, over one. And by doing that, you're, you're making something which again can just be fidgeted with. And that can be very calming if you've chosen the textures and the colors that that child needs and again I say very much that child needs. Now in addition to that other things you can use there are um, move and sit cushions those are like a wedge shaped cushion and the cushion is sort of inflated slightly to whatever degree that child needs they sit on it and it's got bubbles on the top and that has a sensory thing and that can again be very calming for some children so a move and sit cushion can be really calming. Um, another thing is to have a privacy board. A privacy board is basically um, it's three sides and it stands in front and to the two sides and you work at that privacy board station and in doing so um, what happens is you cut out those visual distractions the things that are sensory overload for somebody with sensory issues. So quite often they're in a very plain colour and you might use it, you might add to it something like a, a now and next board, um, a visual timetable. So you've got the information that child needs. It could just be a list of the um, tasks to do for a particular activity or whatever. So you can have what you need there, but no overloading stimuli. 
and that can be really effective. I've used those in classrooms for years and what I've found is quite often children who you don't think have any specific learning needs and they'll suddenly say, can I use the privacy board please? And they just find it, it just helps them to focus, it shuts out the noise. So when you've got this to the right length, you just tie it off, then you cut off the end bits, there you go, and you have a fidget string. And that is something which the textures will be right for that child. They'll have chosen things and they may choose to sort of do this with it, just hold it, pull it. But it's a very simple way of satisfying some people's um, sensory needs as well as their fidgety needs. Another thing is a weighted cushion. Now this is just a plain black one. It's filled with some form of beads. Um, you can, some people like them over their shoulders. It's sort of the weight there helps keep them calm. For others it would go on their lap but again these are sensory things and to then have maybe a sensory area in the school where there is somewhere to go that has different sensory objects there are so many now on the market and um, when I started teaching these these weren't even a thing you know not in a mainstream school now so easy to get hold of every every educational catalog will have some sort of sensory needs toys um, objects whatever you want to call it and this can make a difference just having a calming sensory area sometimes to be more stimulated if you're hypo sensitive and sometimes to be calming if you're hypersensitive so thinking about this because we know if we're not comfortable we can't focus it goes back as basically as Maslow Maslow's areas of need okay those basic areas need to be met if you're going to be able to, to concentrate and to, to reach your potential, which is what we want for everyone. We want people to be in an environment where they're able to learn and we need to be sensitive to people's sensory sensitivities. Thank you.